Okay, welcome back to Wonder. We are on page 205, part 6, and we are back to the narrator of August. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving. How express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world. That's from Shakespeare's Hamlet. North Pole. The spud lamp was a big hit at the science fair. Jack and I got an A for it. So I am on page 206. Jack and I got an A for it. It was the first A Jack got in any class all year long, so he was psyched. All the science fair projects were set up on tables in the gym. It was the same setup as the Egyptian Museum back in December, except this time there were volcanoes and molecular dioramas on the table instead of pyramids and pharaohs. And instead of the kids taking our parents around to look at everybody else's artifact, we had to stand by our tables while all the parents wandered around the room and came over to us one by one. Here's the math on that one. 60 kids in the grade equals 60 sets of parents. And it doesn't even include grandparents. So that's a minimum of 120 pairs of eyes that find their way over to me. How comfortable is that going to be for August? Not comfortable. Not comfortable at all. Eyes that aren't as used to me as their kids' eyes are by now. It's how... it's. It's like how a compass needle always points north, no matter which way you're facing. All those eyes are compasses, and I'm like the North Pole to them. That's why I still don't like school events that include parents. I don't hate them as much as I did at the beginning of the year, like the Thanksgiving sharing festival. That was the worst one, I think. That was the first time I had to face all the parents all, all at once. The Egyptian Museum came after that, but that one was okay because I got to dress up as a mummy and nobody noticed me. Then came the winter concert, which I totally hated because I had to sing in the chorus. Not only can I not sing at all, but it felt like I was on display. The New Year's art show wasn't quite as bad, but it was still annoying. They put up our artwork on in the hallways all over the school and had parents come and check it out. It was like starting some school all over again, having unsuspecting adults pass me on the stairway. Anyway, it's not that I care about, care that people react to me, like I've said a gazillion times. I'm used to that by now. I don't let it bother me. It's like when you go outside and it's drizzling a little, you don't put on boots for a drizzle. You don't even open your umbrella. You walk through it and barely notice that your hair is getting wet. But when it's a huge gym full of parents, the drizzle became, becomes like this total hurricane. Everyone's eyes hit you like a wall of water. Mom and Dad hung around my table a lot along with Jack's parents. It's kind of funny how parents actually end up forming the same little groups as their kids form. Their kids form. Like my parents and Jack's and Summer's mom all like and get along with each other. And I see Julian's parents hanging out with Henry's parents and Miles' parents. And even the two Max's parents hang out together. It's so funny. I told mom and dad about it later when we were walking home and they thought it was a funny observation. I guess it's true, like seeks like, says, said mom. Do your parents hang out with your friend's parents too? Sometimes. Sometimes. The Augie doll. For a while, the war was all we talked about. February was when it was really at its worst. That's when practically nobody was talking to us. And Julian had started leaving notes in our lockers. The notes to Jack were stupid, like, You stink, big cheese, and nobody likes you anymore. I got notes like, Freak, and another that said, Get out of our school, orc. Summer, though, the summer thought we should report the notes to Miss Rubin, 
who was the middle school dean or even Mr. Tushman, but we thought that would be like snitching. Anyway, it's not like we didn't leave notes too, though ours weren't really mean. They were kind of funny and sarcastic. One was, you're so pretty, Julian. I love you. Will you marry me, La Beulah? Another was, love your hair, XOX Beulah. Another was, you're a babe, tickle my feet, XO Beulah. Beulah was a made up person that me and Jack came up with. She had really gross habits like eating the green stuff between her toes and sucking on her knuckles. And we figured someone like that would have a real crush on Julia, who looked and acted like someone in a kid's bop commercial. There were also a couple of times in February when Julian, Miles, and Henry played tricks on Jack. They didn't play tricks on me, I think, because they knew if they got caught bullying me, it would be big time trouble for them. Jack, they figured, was an easier target. So one time they stole his gym shorts and played monkey in the middle with them in the locker room. <clears throat> so imagine going in the locker room to get changed for gym, which is what happens in 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So when you're in the high school, you have to go into the locker room and you have to change from your school clothes into gym clothes. So that's tennis shoes, uh, shorts and a shirt, or like sweatpants and a sweatshirt, something that you can move in, right? What? Girls go in the girls' locker room, boys go in the boys' locker room. There's a, there. well, when I went to school, there was a, combination lock you were all given a lock with a combination on it and you open your locker every you were supposed to take your gym clothes home like every Friday and wash them and bring them back clean on on Monday uh, if you didn't have clothes to dress for gym you got you lost points yeah okay I don't know. It's been a while since I've been in your high school. I would assume so, but I'm not positive. Somebody's nodding. Yes, Miss Richardson. That's what my big sister or brother does. Sister or brother? Both. Both. Okay, perfect. Um, another time, Miles, who sat next to Jack in homeroom, swiped Jack's worksheet off his desk, crumpled it up in a ball, and tossed it to Julian in the, across the room. This wouldn't have happened if Miss Potosa had been there, of course. But there was a substitute teacher that day, and subs never really know what's going on. Do they know? Does Did Miss Richardson, when I sub, know what was going on? Yeah. Usually I did, didn't I? I had a pretty decent idea of what was going on. He never let them see he was upset, though. I think sometimes he was. The other kids in the grade, I'm right here, knew about the war, except for Savannah's group. The girls were neutral at first, but by March they were getting sick of it. And so were some of the boys, like another time when Julian was dumping some pencil sharpener shavings into Jack's backpack. Amos, who was usually tight with them, grabbed the backpack out of Julian's hands and returned it to Jack. It was starting to feel like the majority of the boys weren't buying into Julian anymore. Then a few weeks ago, Julian started spreading this ridiculous rumor that Jack had hired some hit man to get him and Miles and Henry. Who's he talking about? Who's he talking about? Justin. Justin. Remember, Justin went up to them when they were picking on Jack Will, right? And he went to get gum, and then and then after Jack Will left and. And Justin went his way. He saw them, and he went up and talked to them. Uh, this lie was so pathetic that people were actually laughing about him behind his back. At that point, any boys who had still been on his side now jumped ship and were clearly neutral. So by the end of March, only Miles and Henry were on Julian's side, and I think they were even getting tired of the war by then. I'm pretty sure everyone stopped playing the plague game behind my back, too. No one really cringes if I bump into them anymore, and people borrow my pencils without acting like the pencil has cooties. People even joke around with me now sometimes. 
Like the other day, I saw Maya writing a note to Ellie on a piece of ugly doll stationery. And I don't know why, but I just kind of randomly said, Did you know the guy who created the ugly dolls based them on me? Maya looked at me with her eyes wide open like she totally believed me. Then, she, then when she realized I was only kidding, she thought it was the funniest thing in the world. You're so funny, August, she said, and then told Ellie and some of the other girls what I had just said, and they all thought it was funny, too. Like, at first, they were shocked, but then they saw, when they saw I was laughing about it, they knew it was okay to laugh about it, too. And the next day, I found a little ugly doll keychain sitting on my chair with a nice little note from Maya that said, For the nicest Augie doll in the world, XO Maya. Six months ago, stuff like that would never have happened. But now it happens more and more. Also, people have been really nice about the hearing aids I started wearing. Lobo. Lobo. Ever since I was little, the doctors told my parents that someday I'd need hearing aids. I don't know why this always freaked me out a bit. Maybe because anything to do with my ears bothers me a lot. My hearing was getting worse, but I hadn't told anyone about it. The ocean sound that was always in my head had been getting louder. It was drowning out people's voices like I was underwater. You guys know the sound of being underwater and trying to talk to somebody or hear somebody? I couldn't hear teachers if I sat in the back of the class, but I knew if I told mom or dad about it, I'd end up with hearing aids. And I was hoping I could make it through the fifth grade without having that happen. But then in my annual checkup in October, I flunked the audiology test or the hearing test. And the doctor was like, dude, it's time. And he sent me to a special ear doctor who took impressions of my ears. So they would have put something in his ear around his ear so that they would know how big the space was that they were putting hearing aids around or in. Out of all my features, my ears are the ones I hate the most. They're like tiny closed fists on the side of my face. They're too low on my head, too. They look like squash pieces of pizza dough sticking out of the top of my neck or something. Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating a little, but I really hate them. When the ear doctor first pulled the hearing aids out for me and mom to look at, I groaned, Ugh, I am not wearing that thing, I announced, folding my arms in front of me. I know they probably look kind of big, said the ear doctor, but we had to attach them to a headband because we had no other way of making them so they'd stay in your ears. So now he has a band that he has to wear to keep his hearing aids in his ears. Just, just a minute, guys, just a minute. See, normal hearing aids usually have a part that wraps around the outer ear to hold the inner bud in place. So it goes in here kind of like headphones or earbuds. It goes in here and then it wraps around here to keep it in place. But in my case, since I don't have outer ears, they had to put the earbuds on this heavy duty headband that was supposed to wrap around the back of my neck. So it goes like this. I have headphones that go around the back of my neck and then goes on my ears. I can't wear that, Mom, I whined. You'll hardly notice them, said Mom, trying to be cheerful. They'll look like headphones. Headphones? Look at them, Mom! I said angrily, I'll look like Lobo. Which one is Lobo? Said Mom calmly. Lobo? The ear doctor smiled as he looked at the headphones and made some adjustments. The Empire Strikes Back? The bald guy with the cool bionic radio transmitter thing that wraps around the back of his skull? I'm drawing a blank, said Mom. You know Star Wars stuff? I asked the ear doctor. No Star Wars stuff? He answered, slipping the thing over my head. I practically invented Star Wars stuff. He leaned back in his chair to see how the headband fit and then took it off again. Now, Augie, I want to explain what all this is, he said, pointing to the different parts of one of the hearing aids. This curved piece of plastic over here connects to the tubing on the ear mold. That's why we took the, those impressions back in December, so that this part that goes inside your ear fits nice and snug. This part here is called the tone hook, okay? And this thing is the special part we've attached to this cradle here. The lobo part, I said miserably. 
Hey, Lobo is cool, said the ear doctor. It's not like we're saying you're going to look like Jar Jar, you know. That would be bad. He slid the earphones back on my head again carefully. There you go, August. So how's that? Totally uncomfortable, I said. You'll get used to them very quickly, he said. I looked in the mirror. My eyes started tearing up. All I saw were these tubes jutting out from either side of my head like antennas. Do I have to wear this, Mom? I said, try not to cry. I hate them. They don't make any difference. Give it a second, buddy, said the doctor. I haven't even turned them on yet. Wait until you hear the difference. You'll want to wear them. No, I won't. And then he turned them on. to say? It feels like Jack's voice? Yeah. That's really interesting. Maybe... You know how sometimes when you hang out with a friend, you start sounding like them? Have you ever done that before? Yeah, like sometimes when you are hanging out with somebody, you begin to sound and act like them. Yeah. Yeah, so here's his, and I don't know that it looked exactly like this, but I think that's probably what it felt like to him. So, yes, that's part six. That's his hearing aid. All right, we'll talk to you later. Bye.